Morning, everybody. Welcome back to The Opportunistic Trader. It is uh, just after 10 on January 8th, and we're joined by Tony Greer of TG Macro. Uh, Tony's been joining us uh, to discuss macro, equity, different themes, technical analysis, a lot of different uh, sectors, and uh, we've got a lot to talk about. How's it going, Tony? Good, Mike. How you doing, man? Uh, been good, been good. Uh, there's uh, you know a lot of volatility recently. We were just talking, it was nine trading days ago. We traded in the S&P below 2,400, 2,325 ish. And you know, now we're 2,575. VIX has come back uh, just above 20. Um, so, you know, a lot of volatility. Um, I, we haven't heard from you in a little while. I'm interested to get your kind of general thoughts on themes that you're kind of looking at here. Yeah, I love I love how calmly you say the fix is pulling back. You know what I mean? Right, like, right. Well, hey, pulling back from thirty five, thirty five <laughs> to twenty in five sessions, like nothing is wrong. All of a sudden, you know, you know, I think that we are. Uh, my key for the first quarter and first half of this year is honestly that ominous fourth quarter candlestick chart, um, or the fourth quarter candlestick that we put in last year. If you look at a quarterly candlestick chart, and it is pretty clear to me that that quarter is the end of a 10-year equity rally. Um, all of the fundamentals beneath it line up and make sense to me that that should be the sea change that the market needs to have a sort of a little bit more of a significant pullback. Um, I think that that's what we're in the middle of. I think that this is a bear market rally and uh, that we haven't sort of we're temporarily, but well, what it is, it's a reaction to last Friday's blatant, um, you know, emergency Fed action, right, which was getting Bernanke, Powell and Yellen on the television and Powell to sort of say that he's going to be flexible, you know, with his rate path or, or whatever exact words he used. But the market is still, um, you know, chasing that commentary and chasing that sort of posture by the Fed, which they obviously got started early and often in the new year saying, posturing themselves that they are going to be around if the stock market is going to break down. You know, so it's going to be really volatile. Like I, like I told you before in the start off convo, I, you know, I've tried, I've started, you know, with minuscule position sizes this year. Um, I don't think that the year is going to offer any really comfortable trend to trade um, if that changes, I'll, I'll, I'll announce it definitely, you know, for sure. But I think that it's going to be a sort of volatile, at least first half of the year, uh, that doesn't really generate any big trend in one direction or another. Um, I'm most concerned about FANG pulling back. I still think that we've got peak Silicon Valley as clear as could be in the rearview mirror. Um, so that's one of the biggest factors that I think weighs on the market. Um, so that's sort of the center of my focus. But we're also at a situation now, Mike, where, um, you know, for example, I, I just went bullish in oil and oil services again. Um, I feel like oil services just had a dry heave tax loss selling uh, expedition into the end of the year. And I feel like the upside just for a retracement trade is really appealing. Um, you know, we've got the Saudis saying they're going to cut their exports to seven, uh, 7 million barrels a day in order to generate a higher oil price. So that's got the sort of risk on mentality back a little bit this morning. Um, you know, so it's really hard to say, you know, while we're in a retracement rally, I still definitely see some sectors that have got a little bit more of a ways to go before they even reach big resistance. So I'm trying to start off the year with massive patience and absolutely no ego whatsoever. Right, so question on something you just said before. You Please. mentioned that you have uh, smaller positions right now. Now, is that because of the volatility we've seen in December, November, uh, November, December, or is it, in, in, or is it something you typically do at the end of the year and then start fresh at the beginning of the year? Uh, is yeah. That, so, yeah, you know, it's definitely it's definitely something that I start off the year with, regardless of anything, right? Unless I am absolutely on fire and have positions running from last year into this year. Um, that are a large portion of my account, you know, everything that I do gets really, really shrunk back into, let's start by getting some runners on base. Let's start by making contact with the ball. Let's start by making sure that we are in sync with the markets this year, because, you know, I was fairly in sync with them, um, with the market curling over. Um, and I kind of made some really good calls to that end, um, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, you've got Steve Mnuchin texting the world that he's, um, you know, getting in touch with the plunge protection team to make sure that the banks have got money to lend. And then you've got three Fed chairmen on the television at once 
saying that everything is going to be fine. You know, I mean, this is literally, you know, like I wrote this morning, the Fed mandate used to be about employment and inflation. And now that we've got that, the Fed mandate seems to be about keeping the stock market up and keeping Apple rally going. Yeah, you know, those are two uh, interesting ones you just pointed out. I forgot about the Mnuchin one, right? He came out on a weekend and said, hey, you know, we're okay with liquidity. And everyone's like, well, we didn't realize we had, a, had yeah. needed to have you come out in the first place. Yeah, he was like, you know, a little bit like crying fire in the, uh, in the movie theater. And so I feel like, you know, that posture, number one, the Mnuchin thing, and then the Fed thing last Friday, I mean, there is a clear message that's being sent, and I want to make sure that I don't get, you know, um, you know, hit in the face with it in the first week of the year. So that's what, you know, I've started off tipping toe into markets. Um, you know, I put a short treasury trade on because I felt like the time was just right for that trade to turn. And I'm not, again, I'm not looking for a home run trade. I'm looking to get into the mode of the markets and see if my timing is right. Um, you know, I called 2019, I said it's going to be the year of the tactical trader um, because I'm noticing that everyone's uh, predictions on the economy and predictions on the market are almost entirely driven by their opinion on President Trump. And so I think that there are going to be people taking risk and shooting themselves in the face all over the place this year. And I'd like to just be there to be able to take advantage of some of the dislocations and pick up the pieces. So I'm going to be spending a lot of my time this, especially the first quarter, flat with very right. little risk I, on. That's interesting. You brought that up. I remember, I think you tweeted that out, that there was something basically along, somewhere along the lines of Trump supporters are more, more bullish the market, whereas people that are not supportive of Trump are more pessimistic about the market. Yeah, like the biggest the biggest uh, factor to me, Mike, has been how all of a sudden we went from sort of um, a, a steady but slow growth pl uh, program here in the U.S. to all of a sudden everybody is pricing in a recession. It has been the fastest adjustment to a small sample of economic data that I have ever seen in my life. You know, I understand that, you know, the PMIs in Europe pulled back to 50 and I understand that China slowed down a little bit. But I still think that, you know, the U.S. is going to be the leading center of the global economy. And I think that we are in still pretty good shape. So it's kind of shocking to me how everybody just became so negative, the economy. And if you look at it, it's like 80 percent of poll Democrats think that the economy is heading for a recession, while only 16 percent of them have a favorable outlook on the economy. Right. It's because they hate the president. And then you look at the Republicans and, you know, it's more or less 50 50 because they don't really have an idea. They want to be behind Trump and they don't know if it's going to work out. So I feel like that's a big political stigma that's attached to the market this year that I'm going to be on the lookout, you know, to try to trade around a little bit. Yeah. Um, so tell me about you saw the, the Samsung headlines from overnight and you saw the Apple headlines from last week. What are your thoughts on is that something bigger to be more concerned about? Um, well, put it this way, the, the Samsung headline, I still have to get caught up on. Um, I was buried this morning in something else. So I literally do not know what they said. Uh, but it looks like a on sales quarter. decline, profit decline, something like that. Yeah. I mean, Apple and Samsung pretty much have uh, a duopoly on the handset market, right? You know, so there's only two companies there. And if one is suffering, I would imagine that the other one is suffering too because people don't want to stretch and pay for a more expensive upgrade if they have a murkier outlook on the economy or something like that. Um, I'm not really sure what it is. I'm just trying to pay attention to the price action. You know, it was a big concern to me when Apple's suppliers guided lower. I didn't think the market was giving that enough respect. Then it turns out Apple starts off the year guiding lower. And here we are with, you know, a, a pretty much a global figure out how to rescue Apple plan going on. Right. Yeah. <coughs> uh, well, just looking at my take from looking at the Apple and the Samsung is more of there are some they're both warning about global competition, increased uh, uh, margin squeeze uh, just by the competition. And also LG came out as well overnight talking about how they aren't going to make numbers based on the, their handhelds and also all electronics that they do, the TVs, the, you know, the margins are just coming in, the competition to drive prices down. You know, you get a beautiful flat screen now for 200 bucks, whereas before it was, you know, $1,000 a year ago, a few years ago, I should say. Yeah, um, yep, yep. You know, things like that. The but, economies of scale. Yeah. So what sectors are you looking at for, you know, Q1? What do you think is going to outperform? What do you think is going to underperform? 
Um, well, I'm still, you know, my underperformance idea is still focused in tech. It starts out at FANG and it spreads out to the semis. Um, when I look at the semiconductor sector from 30,000 feet up technically, you know, I see, uh, you know, a really long extended rally. And then it took about a year and a half for, um, excuse me, a year for semiconductors to consolidate and then finally break down. Um, my guess is their reaction to that breakdown is going to be more significant than this little 20% pullback that it's seen. So I'm waiting patiently for a rally in semiconductors to sell um, alongside my bearish tech view. I still think the building sector is going to be challenged, but I need a little bit more of a, uh, a serious retracement to put a builder's short out. Again, I still see rising inventories. I still, still see trends toward less home buyers and more renters. And I think that's generally bearish for building. Um, so, you know, I think that sector is going to struggle. Um, I'm cautious right now, you know, put it this way. I don't necessarily believe that the slowdown that the market is pricing in is going to be that severe, but if it is going to be, I'm going to figure out a spot where I can get short XME, um, the industrial metals ETF, because it looks like to me that the sort of, um, they finally have started to curl over in response to this global growth story. And while I am not a, a PhD economist, I'm trying to give what the market is going to, uh, you know, give take what the market's going to give me. If we are going to start ahead into this real tailspin of economic weakness, then we're going to be able to find some sectors that will be easy money to pound on. And I think XME is one of those. So I'm really flexible, Mike. Yeah. Uh, what about the cannabis sector? I know that you were a very active in 2018. What are your thoughts here? Looks great. Looks great. The cannabis sector, you know, in and of itself uh, seems to be doing the same thing that it would be doing if it were totally unplugged from the S&P. Right. It, you know, it, it's, um, it, you know, the, the sector gets over owned and then there's a sort of lag in the headlines. Um, you know, and then you just sit there and wait for the next bullish thing to come out. You know, we've got more states legalizing. Um, I think that we're going to see big pharma push into uh, the cannabis sector. And it just seems like, you know, at this level down at 14 and HMMJ for the last year, you know, it has magically held. And eventually this is going to build a really long base and then rally once the big boys start coming after it. And then once we have banking in 2019, I think that changes everything for the, uh, for the market sort of landscape, because eventually after that, you'll have mutual funds that will come in and start buying them. So that's the, that's the trade that I'm still trying to get ahead of. I still think that makes sense. Do you view the cannabis sector as completely uncorrelated with the, let's call it like if you have an S&P 500 view, could you, do you see that as completely uncorrelated? Mm, I mean, we can, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to make a view. I'm just going to chart them together and tell you that they are unfortunately somewhat correlated. Uh -huh. um, you know what I mean? Like as they crushed stocks into the last quarter of last year, they sure as hell crushed, uh, you know, the marijuana sector from call it 20 to 15, you right. know, that's, that's a 25% haircut that you had to take there. Um, <laughs> You know, but it, it continues to be resilient. And I do, I would imagine that this sector can drastically overperform the S&P in a down tape. So my idea is that, you know, if the S&P goes down a lot, the, that cannabis names will probably range trade or go down a little or set themselves up for a better rally in another market. Um, so, yeah, they're unfortunately going to be correlated, but I think that it, it will eventually performance wise start breaking away from the pack. Yeah. What are your two or three favorite cannabis names? Uh, I like Kron. Kron's been trading really well lately. Um, Kron seems to be able to hold on to its rallies. Kronos Group, right? Um, you know, they announced a big partnership last year. I'm trying to remember who that one was with. They partnered with. Uh, uh, I'm trying to find it. Oh, Altria. There we go. So that partnership looks like that's going to work out. Um, I still like uh, Canopy Growth because I still think they're going to lead in a branding charge and become, you know, the, the sort of household cannabis name. Um, but I'm not really picking any, uh, you know, I, I would say Ianthus is another good stock to own. Um, Sorry, there we go. Um, IANCN uh, is probably going to be a leader in medical marijuana for Canada. That stock looks like it's peaking above moving average resistance levels, and I'm starting to like it a lot more. So those are the ones that I'm looking at. Gotcha. Um, then back to the broader market, 
when when you're looking at the market, what do you think are going to be leading sectors and lagging sectors uh, when we're looking at the market over the next 30 days? Well, that's kind of what I what I just went over. I think tech's going to. I'm looking for tech to be weak. I'm looking for semis to be weak. I look for that to lag this year a little bit different from last year, basis the fact that they consolidated and curled over last year, mm-hmm. um, and I still think the S and P is going to be challenged on the upside. So I, I think that those sectors are challenged, and I continue to be an energy bull just because the downside in these energy stocks, the downside in oil, seems really, really limited to me. Um, especially with everybody now looking for a recession, lower oil prices, et cetera, et cetera. I just did a podcast with somebody last week and they said, are you ready for $20 oil? And I almost threw up. (laughs) I mean, these are the things that make you want to trade. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, I like the energy stuff down here to start the year. Um, It looks like healthcare might be able to pick up where it left off last year. And I think healthcare is going to be a really interesting um, sector to follow this year as we, you know, sort of sort out what direction we might be going as a country. And maybe we have a couple of new healthcare applications to try out. So I'm bullish, you know, healthcare and, and energy. I'm not married to anything. Um, I'm still waiting for a better bounce in home builders and semiconductors because I think those will be a great short um, for at least a trade in the first half of the year. Right. What about emerging markets? I know last year at a certain point you were bearish EM. Are you still bearish here? Uh, I'm less bearish, a little bit basis price action uh, because it stopped going down sharply. It started consolidating. But that makes sense to me if the dollar is going to trade sideways, that emerging markets are going to have to trade sideways for a little bit as well. Um, We're definitely seeing emerging market sales guys trying to pick a value area and say that this is the dip to buy in EEM, you know, the pullback from 50 to 40 is the dip that you buy. And it looks like they've definitely talked some people into making those investments because EEM is hanging in on pretty good volume. You might be able to make a case for a double bottom here. But I still think that in the end, I'm still going with the trend that we're going to have higher yields in the U.S., keeping the dollar strong. And that is going to continue to weigh on emerging markets. I think the current dollar weakness is a function of two things. I think traders came into the year or into the end of the year last year, way too long dollars um, and short treasuries. And I also think that the risk parity de-risking that we saw when Aussie yen collapsed 10%, um, the dollar is naturally going to get hit in sympathy with that. Because if you can't sell your Aussie yen, you sell dollar yen, Swiss yen, cannabis yen, you sell anything you can against yen to get your yen back. So I think that's what's going on in the dollar. And I think that we go back to sort of uh, firm dollar regimes, certainly against the, G, the G7. Perfect. That, that, was, that was the last question I was getting. was going to ask you was the dollar and uh, also re, re, uh, relationship with EM on that. And so you hit on that. Um, you know, it's interesting on that. It, it seems like a lot of banks are actually looking for dollar weakness this year. I think they're looking, one of the main things is they're looking, they're saying that the Fed's probably not going to hike or not two hikes like uh, they are currently saying. And that's one of their reasons for it. But uh, that's a pretty interesting thing because I think if we were to see dollar strength, that would kind of catch the market a little off guard and then also would be a headwind to the equity markets. Yeah. Yeah, it could it could be uh, that makes sense to me as I am looking for a headwind to the commodity markets. So, uh, excuse me, to the equity markets. So, yeah, man, you know, I'm I'm sticking with the dollar picture. Um, you know, you look across the pond, and the only thing that would get you to buy, you know, Europe or the UK is, is betting that they're washed out and all the bad news is on the tape because to me, it still likes it still looks like the Brexit is going to struggle in 2019, and it still looks like France is in for a hell of a year. The never-ending Brexit. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's becoming a saga and I'm not looking forward to the movie, actually. Yeah. All right. Well, I really appreciate the time. A lot of great information. That's Tony Greer of TG Macro. You can check out his information, tgmacro.com. We'll talk to you later. Thanks a lot, Tony. Sounds good, Mike. Have a good day. All right.